Christos, thank you so much for having us in your home. Our colleagues from China, Ambassador from China, Director of the Confucius Institute, who are so, so honored to be together with you and uh, so excited for what our discussions will deliver. And for all colleagues, uh, this is a, a great thrill for us, and uh, I'm so honored and delighted that uh, all of you accepted the invitation to be together. We've already heard that we're in a world of crisis, and we should reflect that as in almost every idea, crisis is a Greek origin word, because our whole intellectual life in the Western world is a Greek world. And interestingly, crisis means decision-making. Making a decision. It's not just, oh, agony. It's what should we do? And that is what philosophy is about. And it is a very practical discipline, which is why philosophers have been chased out of town for more than 2,000 years, because they're often telling people in power what should be done. The difference is typically philosophers are saying what should be done for the good of humanity, not necessarily for the power. And so this is why they get run out of time. So I want to pay homage first to the philosophers. Uh, sometimes it's thought philosophy is an abstract discipline. It is about ideas, but it is about ideas for decision making, for very practical issues. And uh, the great philosophers we will be discussing were very practical people. They were often going from city to city talking to the rulers of the city, trying to guide them. Most of the time ignored, by the way. One of the reasons, since I'm an economic advisor in my professional life for 40 years, one of the reasons I love Plato is that he was a failed advisor three times. And if Plato can fail three times, that frees us up for all of us. We're allowed to fail much more than three times. Because this is practical business we're talking about, but the business of implementing good ideas. Now, we've each been asked uh, to present Aristotle 15 minutes. Uh, it sounds almost like a joke, except I will remind you of a, one of the famous Talmudic or Jewish stories, which is that a, in the first century, a uh, non-Jew comes up to the great Jewish philosopher and teacher, Hillel, and he dares him, teach me Judaism, while, standing, while you are standing on one leg. And Hillel is not insulted. He says, that's easy. Do not do to others what you would not have them do to you. The rest of the religion is just commentary. So this is a first point. Because probably had Confucius been asked the same question, he would have given the same answer. Because in the Analects, he is asked by a disciple, what should we do? And he says the most important is the concept of shu, reciprocity. Do not do to others what you would not have them do to you. So first we can teach Aristotle in less than 15 minutes. Second, we see that the great teachings really span humanity. And the golden rule of Confucius, or of Hillel, or of Jesus, or of other great sages is a common 
heritage of humanity, a common wisdom of humanity. That's really why we are here, because there is a commonality of our human spirit. We have distinct traditions, wisdom, and learning, but we are one common humanity. And more than ever, in the crises, the decisions of the 21st century, we have to act together. And so we have to find our deep roots of common humanity. And this is essential. This is why I'm very grateful to President Xi Jinping also for calling for a global civilizations initiative. This is extremely important. The idea that all of the great civilizations, especially at this time of crisis, at this time of decisions, need to understand each other's wisdom and to build a common wisdom of the 21st century. So that is our purpose together here. And we will make progress, but we will have much opportunity going forward because as the MOU just signed indicates, this is an ongoing collaboration of wisdom and we're profoundly honored for that. So just a few words about Aristotle and why I call myself an Aristotelian, a follower of Aristotle. Because everything I touch, he thought about 2,300 years earlier and typically wrote the best books about it 2,300 years earlier. He was born in Stagira, a Greek city in northern Greece that we will be visiting later in the week in 384 BC. He arrived at Plato's Academy, the academy to which this academy is the heir. Because Plato invented in the Western world academia. Now, that's important for us academics. And we are in the academy of Athens, and we are in the home of academia. In the Western world, there is no other home of academia. It is this place. And even when Roman power came, it was to Athens and to the Greek world that the Romans looked for the wisdom. And so really, Greece was the center of thinking for the Western world from the start and for thousands of years. He came to the academy when he was 17. He became Plato's star student. He stayed for 20 years. Plato died in 347 and then as usual for us academics academic politics took over because Aristotle probably should have become the head of the academy but it was an inside job it was an inside pick and Aristotle went off to Asia Minor with Theophrastus his student and with others because he didn't get the job. So he went to do other things. He went to do some advising, not so successfully, some political advising. Then he arrived at the island of Lesbos and invented biology and zoology. Dissections, classification of animals, whatever he touched, he touched with really genius. And so in those few years in Lesbos and Asia Minor, he opened the world of biology. He invented the ideas of biology that remained the ideas of biology for the next 2,300 years. Then he got a letter. He got a letter from Philip of Macedon. Come tutor my kid. His name's Alexander. He may accomplish something. Aristotle's father had been the physician to the king of Macedonia, Imanus. Now Aristotle was being beckoned to Mieza, which we will be visiting later in the week. 
week to tutor the young Alexander. And no doubt, Aristotle's tutoring helped make Alexander Alexander the Great. Because he knew that his teacher, uh, he, he learned from the greatest thinker. After Alexander went off to conquer the known world in the Western world, he didn't reach China. He wouldn't have wanted to, by the way, but his troops said, the Indus River is far enough, thank you. They almost mutiny, uh, and he returned to Babylon, and then eventually to his, after he died in uh, Babylon, his generals divided up uh, his empire into the Hellenistic kingdoms. But in the meantime, Alexander, I'm sorry, Aristotle returned to Athens. And just a near here, a 15 minute walk uh, in a beautiful grove that was already a gymnasium uh, a, and a place for gathering and where Socrates liked to walk and where Plato liked to teach and where the Athens Assembly liked to be uh, in a place dedicated to the god Apollo Lysias. Aristotle taught in his school the Lyceum in 335. This was not the first university, Plato's Academy was, but it was the first research university because Aristotle built a massive library and created areas of scholarship that are completely astounding for a thousand people, but this was one man who embraced this. He walked through the Lyceum by day, his students taking notes. He walked in the corridors, the Parapetoi, and thereby the school became known as the Parapetetic philosophy, the walking philosophy, the students taking notes behind and publishing the notes as Aristotle's works. They're not as literary as Platonic dialogues. They are note-taking, we think, of one of the greatest minds in human history. I put him right up, basically, at the top. He taught at the Lyceum, which he founded and led until 323, 322 BCE. Alexander the Great suddenly died, and Aristotle suddenly found himself in the midst of anti-Macedonian sentiment in Athens, and Aristotle was not an Athenian. He was Greek, but he was associated with Macedonia, and he famously declared, or is said to have declared, that he would not let Athens do twice the crime of philosophy, referring to the condemnation and death of Socrates that had occurred in 399 BCE. So Aristotle fled to Chalmers, and he died there in 322 BC. Alexander the Great complained about the fact that Aristotle published, and then I show a quote below that Plutarch uh, makes that, why do you publish your works? You taught them to me, now everybody's going to know them. So that was a, Alexander in the beginning, but thank God the world did come to know them. Uh, by the way, in my favorite painting, uh, this is a, a detail of my favorite painting we visited a couple of days ago. For me, it's almost a pilgrimage in the stanzas of Raphael in the Vatican. Uh, this is the detail of the center of the school of Athens, which is Raphael's vision of Western philosophy and its unsurpassable. But of course, in the center are Plato on the left with the Timaeus in his hand about the foundation of the universe pointing heavenward and Aristotle with the ethics in his hand, the Nicomachean ethics, uh, with his hand out indicating the earth, earthly orientation of Aristotle. So Plato was about the forms and the ideals and Aristotle was about empirical observation. 
Plato, I think it's fair to say, was skeptical about what one could learn through the senses. We live in the dark cave of the shadows, but the shadows cast on the cave wall. But Aristotle believed we could use our senses to gain knowledge of the physical world. Every area of knowledge Aristotle not only touched, basically he invented. If you're an academic, this is very annoying. Every book he published was the first of the field and in my view, often the best ever of the field. I personally don't think the Nicomachean ethics has ever been surpassed in ethics. And I don't think that the politics has ever been surpassed in political science. I mean that literally, not figuratively. These are the greatest books. And they were the opening books. He invented political science. He collected the constitutions of the Greek world, compared them, studied them, uh, debated the, what kinds of forms of government one should have. He, he didn't invent ethics. Uh, the ideas of ethics can be found in the, the Temple of Apollo and Delphi. They can certainly be found in Socrates' teachings and in the dialogues of Plato. But Aristotle was systematic about ethics and gave us absolutely key categories that we have never surpassed and that I believe are our basis of ethics today. But I just list some of the fields. So I want to quickly, I way over time, I didn't do it like Hillel did, but Hillel was more clever. Um, I just want to mention some of the ethical ideas that I think are as foundational for our discussion. First, perhaps most importantly, is human nature. Aristotle, like Plato, said we have divided souls. This is a, a basis of both uh, Western and Eastern philosophy. Uh, this is debated in uh, Chinese, or, uh, of course, in Confucian uh, thought. Are humans basically good, or are they basically bad? How do we make the good? Fundamental questions, and for Aristotle, the three parts of the soul, or the psyche, uh, are the vegetative part, all living, uh, living organisms have this nutritive need, reproductive need. Then there is the sensitive and perceptive soul of animals who move, who sense, who have reflexes. But Aristotle's point was only humans have rational thought. And Aristotle, Plato and Aristotle put a rationality at the soul of the Western philosophical idea for the next 2,300 years. It is the core of Western philosophy. Think before you act. And the whole teaching of the Nicomachean ethics is a dog cannot do that. A dog has reflexes. But a dog cannot think before acting. Aristotle is quite explicit about that. The whole point of the ethics, supposedly to his son Nicomachus, is think before you do something stupid. That's the core. And Aristotle said, you know what? It is hard. It takes time. It has to be cultivated. Young people cannot be wise. It takes enough time to learn. So man's purpose, Helos, is to develop the rational soul. And the greatest good, or happiness, to translate the Greek uh, concept, eudaimonia, or eudaimonia, is the activity of the soul according to reason. So all of these parts of our psyche, we must learn to use reason is the essence. Moral virtue, virtue is the excellence of the soul. The word virtue in Greek, I read it, means excellence. So moral excellence is excellence of the soul according to reason. Emotions are important, but they should be aligned with reason, not pulling away from reason, not uh, guiding reason. More than 2,000 years later, David Hume and British philosophy would turn this on its head, which is a big mistake in my view. 
where he said that reason should be the slave of the passions. For all of Western thought up until then, it was the reverse. Keep your passions under control. Think. I think it's a good idea, by the way. I'm not with you on this one. Fifth point, moral virtues must be cultivated. This aligns so well with Confucian thought. It is the same. Good virtue comes from cultivation. It's not something, it's a potentiality, but the realization of virtue is earned through hard work. Happiness is earned. Happiness is an excellence. It's not just something that comes to you. Moral virtues include acts of moderation. This is the central way. This aligns very well with many philosophies, including Buddhist philosophy, the middle path. The path between deficiency or insufficiency and excess. Aristotle said, keep the middle way. You don't have to be self-denial ascent, but don't fall into the traps of excess, excess of greed, excess of gluttony, and so forth. And finding that middle path is wisdom, practical wisdom, which the Greeks call phronesis, which we translate as prudence or sound judgment. Importantly, these virtues apply in many dimensions of our life, as individuals making individual choices, as members of a household, as members of a community, and as members of a political community, the polis. We are citizens, we are individuals, we are friends. In all of those, we need to exercise virtues. This is very important, because virtue comes in many different dimensions, in your economic transactions, as a voter, as an individual, as a father, as uh, whatever role you're playing, the virtues will apply. Aristotle said there's no list to apply, only general guidelines. That's what makes this tough. That's why artificial intelligence is a little hard. There's no list, and because artificial intelligence learns from human behavior, it will incorporate all the mess as well, by the way. It won't just be the rational decision making. For Aristotle, the best kind of life was the life of contemplation, because that also brings the human being together with the divine. And for Aristotle, the divine was the unmoved mover, the first mover, the creator. And this was the highest that humanity can achieve. Aristotle insisted crucially, especially in the politics, that man is a zoan politicon, a political animal. We are made for life in a political community. We cannot be happy except in community. A person who would live alone, said Aristotle, is either a beast or a god. The rest of us live in community. We must have the virtues of community life. Here is the problem that Plato and Aristotle tried to solve. To have a virtuous political system, you need virtuous citizens. To have virtuous citizens, you need a virtuous political system. It seems like a circular problem, and indeed it is. And for 2,300 years, we've tried to find what are the entry points into that circularity. How do you make good citizens if the leaders are bad? How do you make good leaders if the citizens are badly informed or without virtue? This is the same issue that Confucius was trying to address. Because Confucius was trying to say, how do you make virtuous people a virtuous leader? So that was Confucius' entry point. Then he went to look for them. It wasn't so easy to find them. So, the constitution of the state or the Polish should aim to produce epidemia. This is very important. 
In the U.S., the Constitution is to manage power. But for Greek philosophers, the Constitution is to produce happiness. And this, I think, is the core right idea of politics and the right idea of political science. The most important idea. Politics is for a purpose, not for the prince, but for the well-being. And this is not so clear in our teaching and in our real life. So politics is a properly seen as a branch of ethics. Aristotle famously taught that all forms of government, and he named three main ones, government by one, by a few, or by many, could be good in the case of monarchy, aristocracy, and republicanism, or could be bad in the case of tyranny, oligarchy, and mob rule. So his question was how to keep the good forms of governance, not the bad forms of governance. His answer was twofold. Mixed systems, partly of the few, the one, the few, and the many, different forms within one constitution, and limited inequality. Because he was the first to say a middle class. He wasn't the first with that idea. Saul probably may have been the first with that idea. But he was the first to write it clearly that you need a middle class for political stability. Of course, let's take a note to remember the downside. Slaves and women for Aristotle were outside of this. So this is something of his times because he lived in a slave-owning society. He wrote, unfortunately, about natural slavery, that some are natural slaves, some he felt were not properly slaves, that they were captured people of virtue. But this is a complicated question we'll come back to. Now, just to conclude, it's important for all of us, and I know many of our Chinese colleagues are expert in all of this, but for all the Chinese colleagues, to understand how profound the influence of Aristotle has been for 2,300 years. If one says that Confucius's influence is obvious in the design of statecraft, in the ideas of Chinese civilization, I would argue that Aristotle's influence is similar in the Western world. How deep and how multiple are the channels. So I list many, I don't have time to go into them. One is simply the Hellenistic kingdoms. Because there is a link, there actually is, I believe, from Aristotle and Alexander to his tolerance of other cultures, the way he designed the, uh, his Hellenism, and what transpired afterwards in the Greek knowledge. The legacy of the Lyceum as creating the Western Research University is direct. It's not uh, only metaphorical, especially during the European Middle Ages when all the European universities were formed along Aristotelian lines. The organization of knowledge in Western uh, epistemology logic, metaphysics, physics, biology, ethics, political science, these are Aristotelian categories. The centrality of rationality as a concept of Western civilization, I would say the concept of the philosophy of Western civilization is a Socratic, Platonic, Aristotelian concept. Aristotle was called the philosopher or the teacher in the high Islamic world, in the world of Al-Kindi, Al-Qurabi, Abelos, Abyssana. The great, great uh, Islamic teaching of Baghdad, of Cordoba, uh, of Postdoc uh, and Cairo. This is Aristotelian teaching. The great Jewish rationalism is Maimonides. Uh, also, a, he was, uh, uh, he learned from Averroes, he learned his texts from the Arabic texts, he was uh, also, 
like Aristotle, uh, and Aristotle's father, physician, uh, to uh, the Ayyubid uh, Sultan Saladi uh, in the 1190s. Uh, and so, direct impact of Aristotle in the Jewish rationalism for the last 1,000 years. Not always popular, sometimes my analogies was banned by other Jewish teachers. Too rational. But this is the kind of debate that has happened in all of the monotheistic faiths that Aristotle so much influenced. Aristotle became the basis for the fusion of revelation and, and uh, rationality epitomized and developed by Thomas Aquinas, professor at the University of Paris, saint of the Catholic Church, and next year will be his 750th anniversary of his Summa Theologica and his death in 1274. And it's through Aquinas that Aristotle infuses the spirit of rationality of the Catholic Church and the Catholic faith, which is absolutely fundamental for Western civilization. In 1891, Pope Leo XIII, well, actually, starting in 1878, Pope Leo XIII said that Aquinas is our teacher of philosophy. And in 1891, Pope Leo XIII issued an encyclical called Rare Novara, The New Things About Industrialization, drawing on Aquinas, therefore drawing on Aristotle. This is a direct line, 2,300 years into absolutely the most modern and influential social teachings of our time. And now we are, I think, in the last 50 years in philosophy, in moral philosophy, in, I believe, but I, in the rule of philosophers, but I'd like to believe in the flowering and renaissance of virtue ethics, which I believe is the right ethics of moral philosophy. Uh, as I read Kant, uh, as I read uh, Benton, uh, I'll put aside Hobbes and you, but I'll take those. I find Kant also is uh, a virtue ethicist, even though he's classified as a damn ethologist, but there's enough virtue ethics uh, in there to satisfy me. Uh, but I would say that we have a flower of virtual ethics and, of course, Confucius and the Confucian tradition of 2,500 years is a virtual ethics of the most profound sort. And it is that version, I think, which gives me the greatest hope for the world and the greatest hope for crisis as decision making for the human good. Next, I would like to uh, ask uh, Yon Lee, Professor of Philosophy and Associate Dean of the School of Philosophy. Thank you very much for being here. Time I have a video. Yes. Great. Uh, it's, uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great honor to be in this uh, great city, uh, great place. Uh, all the friends asked me uh, how much did I pay to get a speak right after uh, Jeff Sachs. Um, so I did not pay. Um, um, I, I thought we have so many uh, leading scholars in philosophy, other areas, from China, for example, Professor Yamoto Wolfman, Professor Wang Hui, and uh, Professor Dong Yang uh, from China, but also we have the leading philosophers like uh, Professor Alvin Blackman, uh, Robbie Wong. All those leading scholars, they had uh, a difficult time to pick which one to speak right after Jack. So finally, they picked me, this young, 
fearless Chinese guy to speak right after them to be the easiest to choice. So, by the way, I'm very uh, honored to be here. Um, it's very difficult to imagine uh, Western civilization without uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Uh, similarly, it's very um, uh, almost impossible to imagine Chinese culture, Chinese civilization without uh, Confucius. So today I'm going to give you a very uh, brief presentation on who is Confucius, the philosophy of Confucius, and what makes uh, Confucius uh, distinctive and uh, his impact throughout history. And also, uh, I would argue at the end, uh, Confucius uh, should be treated as a liberator rather than a defender of the status quo. So, uh, Confucius uh, grew up in a single parent household. His father died uh, when he was three years old, and uh, he grew up in poverty. Uh, his mom raised him uh, by herself. And uh, through uh, his early life, he, uh, he was a relatively low level official during his uh, political tenure. He, uh, 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 he tried to practice uh, what he believed, uh, he left the government, and also uh, he retired from that position. He spent uh, about a decade uh, with some of his students travel around uh, uh, different states trying to preach the idea of the ruling. Um, so after uh, he failed to convince all those uh, politicians to express his uh, ideas, he retired to his home state, Lu, and uh, to be uh, to resume to be a full-time teacher. Uh, it was said that he had uh, over 3,000 students, and some of those uh, over 70 were very uh, distinctive. Also, uh, uh, during uh, his late life, he spent a lot of his time trying to do uh, editing and commenting on Chinese ancient uh, classics. Um, but uh, uh, most of all, even though his ideas were not impressed um, during his time, and he uh, is remembered as the greatest philosopher and the book of the Analyst is a record of between and his disciples. Uh, so, uh, conceptually speaking, uh, Confucius uh, did have the idea of heaven and the gods in his uh, philosophy, but uh, the most important concepts were the idea of way, uh, virtues, and good nature. So, in general, we treat uh, Confucius as a uh, uh, humanist rather than a supernaturalist. And uh, uh, with regard to his ethics, uh, Jeff was uh, briefly, uh, briefly mentioning that uh, uh, Confucius was also a virtual theorist. So he uh, argues that by cultivating our shared human dispositions, uh, we become virtuous dreams uh, uh, or gentlemen. And the family is uh, uh, the most important place to cultivate those virtues. And after you become a virtuous person in the family, you, uh, you become a virtuous person in your own community. Uh, with regard to his political philosophy, uh, this is very distinctive of his view. The well-being of the people as the ultimate end of uh, a government. So this is related to the traditional idea of Minbe in uh, Chinese history, and also related to the current idea of serving the people really before a contemporary Chinese uh, ideology. And uh, uh, this service conception of political legitimacy is in clear contrast with uh, modern Western contractarian understanding of uh, political legitimacy. So, uh, what makes Confucius very distinctive? Uh, based on what Jack said about Aristotle, it looks like Confucius is very similar to uh, Confucius. Uh, however, whenever you think of Confucius, you have to put him uh, in his background, in his, uh, put him in his time. So he lived in an extremely chaotic time. 
So at that time, the East Digital Royal Academy lost control of all the states. So stronger states, they were fighting each other, they tried to take over small states. Uh, very unfortunately, Confucius uh, was, uh, his home state was very small and it was constantly the target of conquering by uh, the big states. Um, so, during this difficult time, he argues uh, where such military power should be, should not be the aim, the goal, the purpose of political ruling. Instead, he argues for the importance of virtues and moral motivation. And also, uh, very different from his contemporary uh, scholars or thinkers, he did not argue for the interests of the ruler, the powerful and the dominant groups. He went for the angle, right? The rule, the common people, and the mass. That also makes him very distinctive at his time. He also argues uh, the importance of philanthropy and duty, uh, governance, rather the importance of punishing the laws. This puts him in a clear contrast with many other uh, leading thinkers of his time. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, how the Confucius uh, impact the rest of Chinese history. So first of all, I think his idea of family is really important uh, in his own law cinematic construction. Uh, he believes that getting married, having children, is crucial for being a virtuous person. Uh, education is the right way to cultivate one's moral virtues and the caring for seniors is very essential to keep a virtuous familiar relationship which is not very well practiced in contemporary days. Um, he also, uh, the idea of ritual is also significant for him. He does believe that by carrying out communal rituals it would bring order, stability, and harmony to the community. For those who have been to China, uh, even uh, today, if you uh, go to Chinese wedding ceremonies and burial ceremonies, you will be surprised how much formality, uh, how much substantial content of rituals that were hit throughout history. Again, back to the ideal service conception of political legitimacy. Uh, the idea of well-being, material flourishing, and also moral flourishing were key to Confucius' idea. And the moral education is very important. As a result of this, the distinction between public and private was blurred in Confucianism. And that idea has a huge impact even today in Eastern Asian societies. Again, many liberal Western scholars might be shocked by this, but we have keep this tradition in East Asia for many, many years. Uh, because in modern enlightened time, we think the private should be abstained from uh, the public. But in Confucianism, that's not the case. Uh, so last, I want to argue that Confucius should be treated as a liberal. Uh, for the past 120 years, uh, many uh, leading intellectuals in China criticize Confucius being the defender of the backwards, the feudal, feudal society, feudal cultures. Um, uh, so even today, many conservatives try to appeal to Confucius' ideas to defend some of those old ideas. However, in the time of dramatic social changes, not just in Asia, not just in uh, right, uh, the eastern part of the world, global, we have uh, serious issues, gender inequality, uh, racial discrimination, uh, homophobia, uh, class inequality, those are common issues. Uh, so, what will Confucius do? As I was saying, many people did try to take passages from the islands, try to defend gender inequality, try to defend uh, racial discrimination, try to defend homophobia. 
I try to defend that the Assyrians have been the Jews that shall be in my name today. Uh, however, I think Confucius will not defend the character prejudice and injustice similar to his criticism against the prejudice of his time. Um, so I, I give you one quick example of the science here, I several minutes left. For those who uh, come from Asia, come from the Confucian uh, traditional uh, countries, right, there is a, a heated debate uh, whether people should uh, get married, whether people should have children. If you go to big cities like Beijing and Shanghai, uh, we have a lot of uh, middle-aged, single, uh, young uh, people who constantly are pressured by their parents, by their peers, by their friends, by their colleagues uh, to get married. Because Confucius said, if you don't get married, it's one of the three most unfamiliar things you could do. Uh, so, and also the same thing about childbearing. It was regarding that feeling. Um, I think that Confucius would not insist on the particular forms of social life in his time, rather than on the of values, being uh, benevolent, righteous, rituals, harmony, and others. Um, Jeff uh, briefly mentioned uh, Aristotle was a supporter of slavery, right? A supporter of uh, gender discrimination. Uh, it's reasonable to expect philosophers to rise above this type, but we cannot expect them to go that far. Then they will be gods, right? They are not gods. They have to be constrained yeah, by their uh, time, right? Um, so, uh, uh, overall, I think Confucius should be regarded as a liberal reformer. This is uh, uh, in the spirit of uh, Confucianism overall. Uh, philosophy for Confucius is a weapon to break all the shacks, all the oppressions. Uh, it's very unfortunate. Sometimes philosophy is used by people trying to oppress, uh, by people to uh, maintain status quo. I think Confucius would be against this, and I think uh, he would be furious uh, if he knew that uh, his philosophy is, is used by conservatives uh, uh, to defend uh, gender equality, to defend uh, racial discrimination, to defend uh, um, all those injustices. I think the Confucius would argue that uh, we should use philosophy to liberate people. We should not force middle-aged men, women in Asia to get married just because Confucius said that 2,000 years ago. That's just ridiculous. Right? So I think Confucius would encourage people to find a, a, a be, find the spirit of being human by the spirit of benevolence in their daily life, try to fight for uh, what's a good life in today. Um, so that's my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Well, we have a, a wonderful panel today introducing some of the wisdom of the Aristotelian and more broadly European traditions, um, and also the wisdom of the Confucian, but also more broadly the Chinese philosophical traditions. Um, and I won't, uh, my panelists are very distinguished, and so it will take too long to explain all their accomplishments, but uh, we're looking forward to the presentation. And I'll start things off by talking a little bit about the So in 17th century Europe, there were three major theories about the origin of philosophy. If you look at the textbooks of Europe in the 17th century, the first major theory was that philosophy began in Africa. And Africa gave philosophy as a gift to Europe. The second major theory in the 17th century was that philosophy began in India. And from India, philosophy was imported into I'm sure you can imagine what the third major theory was. The third major theory was that philosophy started independently in both Africa and India, and Africa and India both came to Europe. 
Yes, the view that philosophy started once and only once in history and started in Europe was considered a strange idiosyncratic view in Europe as late as the 17th century. Now, the view that philosophy did not start in Europe did not lead people to have any less respect for the tradition that goes back to Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. But it made them think of philosophy as something that was intrinsically multicultural. And I'll just mention, since Jeff referred to Raphael's beautiful painting, The School of Athens, that as Jeff knows, this painting is intrinsically multicultural. It's in the Vatican, but it features the pagan philosophers Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. It features the Islamic philosopher of Arabs. And it features the woman philosopher Hypatia, although she's disguised as a man in the painting to satisfy Raphael's sex of hatred. So unsurprisingly, given the European understanding of philosophy as intrinsically multicultural, when Jesuit missionaries brought that knowledge of Confucianism to Europe, it was immediately recognized by philosophers as a profound and deeply philosophical tradition. The sayings of Confucius and Chinese are the Lunyu, and nowadays they're usually referred to as the Analects in English. But the first translation of the Analects into a European language was done by Jesuits who translated the Analects into Latin. And they translated it under a title that would be rendered in English as Confucius the Chinese Philosopher. Other people in Europe were also fascinated by Chinese philosophy. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, one of the major figures still on the curriculum of early modern philosophy, actually thought that Confucian ethics was better than European ethics. And he said, this is Leibniz, they understand better the precepts of ethics and politics adapted to the present life and the use of mortals. Leibniz, of course, developed binary arithmetic, which is the basis of computers. So next time you use a computer, make sure to thank philosophers and you're welcome. And when Leibniz learned about the E, J, and the classic of changes, he was stunned because he realized that Chinese thinkers had independently discovered binary arithmetic before he did. Because the changes is built on a system of broken and unbroken lines, essentially zeros and ones. Well, given how popular Chinese philosophy was when it was first introduced to the West, you can only assume that it continued to be central to the curriculum even to the present day. But it did not. In fact, it is almost impossible to study Chinese philosophy in a doctoral program in the English-speaking world today. What happened? Now, I'm a great fan of the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, and in some ways I consider myself a Kantist. But the fact is that while Kant certainly did not invent racism, he bought into pseudo-scientific notions of race and propagated. In Kant's lectures, Kant breezily told his students that the races could be hierarchically ranked with whites at the top. And, pardon me, but I'm using his words, not mine, Kant said the Hindus were beneath the whites. Kant said, quote, the Hindus all look like philosophers, but they will never achieve abstract concepts, and so are incapable of philosophical. Kant also said that the Chinese were at about the same intellectual level as the Hindus. In fact, Kant assured his students, quote, a concept of virtue and morality never entered the hands of the Chinese. According to Kant, beneath the Hindus and the Chinese races were the people from Africa, and beneath them were the indigenous Americans. Only, quote, the race of the whites, Kant said contains all talents and motives in itself and is capable of true philosophy. Kant's students went on to rewrite the philosophy textbooks so that the history of philosophy appeared to be a single line going back to ancient Greece 
and groping more or less clearly towards the critical idealism of Kant and his students wrote Africa and Asia out of the philosophy textbooks in Europe, whereas they had been central before. Personally, I love the tradition that goes back to Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. I teach it, and I try as best as I can to live in accordance with its ideals. However, I also love the tradition that goes back to Confucius and Lao Tzu and the Buddha. I teach it, and as best as I can, try to live in accordance with it. I wrote a book taking that philosophy and multicultural manifesto, encouraging my fellow philosophers and intellectuals to take that philosophy in two senses. First, to take that philosophy to its earlier cosmopolitan idea, in which philosophy belongs to many cultures and is not the parochial possession of any one culture. Second, I urge us to take that philosophy to the ideal of philosophy as a way of life. So philosophy is not just an intellectual partner that you can play with symbols, but rather about how one should live and how one should organize for society. This is what Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were concerned with. This is also what Confucius, Lao Tzu, and the Buddha were concerned with. I'm going to end my talk today by offering a conceptual framework for understanding the similarities and differences between the Confucian and Aristotelian. My own scholarly work is focused on the idea that we can interpret both Aristotelianism and Confucianism as forms of virtue ethics. I argue that although they differ much in their details, Aristotelianism and Confucianism are similar in that they focus on four themes. What is the best way to live? What virtues do you need in order to live a good life? How do you cultivate those virtues in yourself? And what is human nature like, such that it's possible to cultivate these virtues and live that way? We find terms corresponding to these four concepts in multiple languages. What is the best way of life? What is in Greek, eudaimonia? In Latin, beatitudo? Or in Chinese, what is the da, the way? What virtues do you need to live well? What is in Greek, arete? Or in Latin, virtu? Or in Chinese, da? What is human nature like such that we can acquire the virtues? In Greek, what is kousis? In Latin, what is natura? In Chinese, what is shape or run shape? How can you cultivate these virtues in yourself? In other words, what is the proper form in Greek of idea? Or in Latin, humanitas? Or in Chinese, shogun or shesh? In today's world, we are unfortunately again seeing the rise of ethno-nationalism and fascism, which we thought we had defeated in World War II. And let us remind ourselves quickly that China and the U.S. were allies in that first victory over fascism. What well, we need to oppose the forces of hate and division today is a genuinely cosmopolitan and humanitarian approach to philosophy. As one great poet, Terence said, I am a human and nothing human is alien to me. Or, as one of Confucius' disciples put the same point, so I your name, Jeff and within the four scenes, all our sayings. I hope you will take these sayings as our model in this conference. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be Professor Zhang uh, Liao. Yeah. 
and then China said, yeah, good. Cool. So just that the interface of publication to Chinese classes, the first time they translate the Chinese the Zhong Yong of publishers into the doctrine of the name. Though actually, just like a kind of to use another translation, it's called stay the equivalent and the home. But finally, he gave up this translation and he decided to use the doctrine of the name to translate Zhong Yong in English. And then the other one is Hong Yong Lan, a very popular Chinese philosopher. And the Hong Yong Lan, in the a short history Chinese philosophy, he said, the Zhong is like an Aristotelian idea of the golden name. And the real meaning of the golden name is never too much, not too less. That is just the right. So here, translation is not only a matter of language or thing, it's also a matter of understanding. So when Jack Black and Hong Lan use the, the name to translate Zhong Yong in Confucianism, it shows that these two terms are related in philosophical thoughts. However, it's not so easy to clarify the meaning of this term. There are many ambiguities in the explanation of the doctrine of the name, so that the interpretation is controversial. So in general, both Confucianism and Aristotle use the name or Zhong Yong in two different but related senses. The first one is related to virtue, of course. So here, one is that the moral virtue is concerned with the feelings and tendencies particular to all virtues. And the name or Zhong Yong in this respect consisting in awarding excessive or efficient feelings. So in that case, the name in temperament refers to the middle position of the emotional scale, particular to the various motors. Both Confucius and Aristotle, I think, is very interesting because both of them have used a same metaphor, the metaphor of actual, in this metaphor, to express the moral commotion of the name. But there is another kind of meaning to understand the name. I think it's from the sense of practical wisdom. So while Confucius and Aristotle also discussed uh, this thing, this is the right way of virtue in moral practice. And in this sense, it's closely related to a person's specific external environment. So the me, as the per perfect virtue, is not only a balance of the internal emotions or internal feelings, but also Allows people to respond appropriately at the, at the moment according to specific external uh, environments. So uh, I will give uh, two examples in my own point. If you have my point, you can collect the quotations. So here we can see time is a very important factor when Confucius and Aristotle to talk about the meaning of Zhong Yong. So for example, I can give three examples. They both the first is the brave person. When we talk about the brave person, it needs not only a disposition to avoid extreme fear or absolute certainty, but also to know who to fight and when. The second is when we talk about the generous person, it's not only never stingy or wasteful, but also need to know who should be generous and how to give it to is the really top and honest of a person or honest person of people. It's not only neither blind face nor broken face in words of behavior, but also need to know what commitments to keep and how to keep them in a specific situation. So if a person's feelings and actions are appropriate in this respect, then he or she comes to the middle way of virtue in the sense of practical wisdom. So this is a two dimensions or two senses both Confucius and Aristotle talk about the main or the doom. However, I think this does not mean that Confucius and Aristotle's understanding of the main and related moral cognition at the same time uh, is the same. So they differ actually in ideas of their understanding of human nature. Uh, I have told this from the first of the sentence in the doctrine of the name, 
when Confucius talk about the mean and the, the human nature. Uh, I can notice, we can notice that Aristotle, in his essence, he, yeah, he distinguishes between the natural virtue and the real virtue. However, Confucius, in his uh, talk about the doctrine of mean, he believed that on the one hand, the mean is rooted in the inherent virtue of human nature. Well, on the other hand, it needs to present in moral practice as stated at the beginning. So, in summary, I'm going to go to summary and to conclusion. The mean regarded by Confucius and Aristotle as the sincere virtue is not only a virtue, it but also is a kind of practical wisdom. So the doctrine of the mean is not just the same moderation in the sense of grace or in the sense of quantity, but also it's about what is right or what is reasonable. So in other words, the explanation of the mean is related to the understanding of good and evil in morality. And I think this is an important topic in two today. So thank you, thank you very much.
mere limits to the satisfaction of human needs. So this immediately, uh, I think, the equal needs of the ecological concept. Now, for example, in the European thought, the equality of all things is would be assigned to the things of pantheism. Yet the notion of the equality of all things has nothing to do with the idea of God. Its origins lies in the philosophy of Johnson, a representative figure of Taoism and in the Yukakara, the ancient Namwara idealism that men from the Kanghainese idea. They are both trying to combine the Buddhist idea of Kinda, because Johnson didn't talk about the Kinda. He tried to combine that to the equality of all things together with the idea, the Buddhist idea of Kinda, that the equalities. So, so the, the, the thesis of the equality of all things does not presuppose any such universal thesis. It should be understood as a kind of the basic principle or a prescription, not a description, according to which each thing in the universe, along with its special properties, ought to be respected. So the notion of an equality of all things in discipline absorbs the human beings into the category of all things. It neither abolishes the difference between the humans and the things, nor that between the things. Instead, it considers these differences in themselves as the prerequisites of equality. So the equality of all things is a universal concept of equality that begins from the perspective of the things. These perspective works on the two levels. On the one level, the universal but unequal relationship between the humans and the things is a mirror image of the situation that prevails among humans themselves. On the other hand, levels, we find that the unequal relationships are in fact created by the language, name, and effect. So these are kind of logic issues, the main concept issue again. So essentially, as soon as things have become, has been stripped of their concrete singularity, their function becomes their substance in form of their severability for human ends. For example, from the anthropocentric viewpoint, modern equality creates a situation in which humans are the subject and things are the objects. So, uh, consequently, the object's world is woven into a hierarchy of values as measured by its functional potential. So that, I think, is even for the equality of capabilities, those capabilities should be interpreted as certain kind of things exchanging its commodities, certain commodities. So it's lost its own basis. Okay. So one minute, I, I, I just... I try to compare something between... Sorry. I just jump to the end of it. So, uh, the, the equality of all things can be further developed on the two levels. The first of these concerns, errors that have been overlooked in the treatments of the seas of complex equality of problems equality. The idea here is to integrate the relationship between the human mind and the nature into the discussion in order to overcome the anthropocentrism inherent in these notions of equality. Second, in fact, that there is a Good deal of overlap between it and ecologism. Ecologism is not a form of naturalistic fetishism, subsiding the anthropocentrism, but a mode of observation based on the placement of human and human activity within natural history. So the question of the justice of future generations 
because we, we talked about the equality only in the existing human, human beings. And the last sentence, I think. On the second level, difference in itself acts as a prerequisite of the equality. Understanding the difference as equality does not mean the weaving differences into the fabric of names and appearances. For that would only subject difference to the hierarchical relations. It also does not mean that equality is equivalent to the abolition of the differences. The philosophy of the equality of all things interprets equality as the overcoming of differences within the realm of names and that the second side kind of the sutra here is since the equality in difference is linked to the overcoming of names and appearances which are embodied directly in the state and the society, it can be interpreted as an actively political notion, one that refuses to let itself be defined by appearances. Thank you. Yes. 
capacity to learn. That is to engage in self-cultivation, self-edification, and we alone have the capacity to craft ourselves into something more perfect and more beautiful than we were in our image, in the show natural state. Being a craftsman of our own character, we are to ceaselessly carve and engrave ourselves into more exalted forms. And this is what makes Shunzi so beautiful. It's this idea that engaging in this activity of self-cultivation is, in fact, the ultimate human way. That this is how we achieve being our most human. Every time I think about this idea, I'm inclined to pause and bask in the glow, speak in the hope. Right? But the utmost expression of our humanity is to exceed our capacity to, is to exercise, sorry, our capacity to learn and to strive to make ourselves better than our natures. And while Shunzi might quibble with my phrasing, basically the human essence is best achieved only in so far as our natures are applied in the self-crafting practice of self-improvement. So much so that the Shunzi's text first chapter is an exhortation to learning, in which we are told that learning must never stop. And in fact, he says, learning proceeds until death, and only then does it stop. That the order of learning has a stopping point, and its purpose cannot be given up for a moment. To pursue it is to be human. To give it up is to be a priest. Or to paraphrase uh, Jeffrey Sachs' summary of the Nicomachean ethics, it's to end up living the life of the God. And to draw near to the right person. Rituals and music provide common models, but they give no precepts. And in the odes and history or the spring and animals, there might be ancient stories, but no explanations of their application. And while activities such as our own academic ones, in which we read and study the classics, as Shunza says, is a good start, it is hardly sufficient. This is one reason that drawing to the right person and having a teacher is so vital for someone. Because someone needs to provide you with the understanding of the underlying principles. But also because the type of learning required is so much about the patterns and the forms and the prescriptive rituals and norms that we get from the classes. But the focus is rather that the underlying attitudes and virtues embedded therein are really the things that we need to grow and develop. And this type of learning required in the activity of cultivating ourselves as humans is one that's meant to change and mold the troublesome dispositions and desires such that we acquire a new way to orient ourselves in the world. It's about transformations that are evidence in actions and not heavy heaven truth. So we need a teacher and a model to help us learn more. Not just to understand the patterns and forms of virtue, but also a good teacher who is an exemplar for those virtues in practice. Practicing these patterns are that by which you correct your person, but the teacher is that by which you correct your practice. Much like how we've been given guidelines on the proper form and duration of our presentations, Professor Brennan Norton has service as our teacher by correcting how we put these guidelines into practice. So we need a teacher and a model, and if we rely on the proper model and also deeply understand its categories, he says, only then will we act with comfortable, comfortable mastery. Right? And if we pursue this diligently with deliberate effort, we repeatedly recite our learning in order to master it and ponder it over in order to comprehend it and make our persons arrested well in it and eliminate things harmful to it in order to nourish it, then we can hope to come to a point where we love learning and virtue. And our eyes love it more than the colors and our ears love it more than the 
bones and our mouths love it more than the five flavors, and our heart considers it more profitable than Pesach in the whole world. We live by this, we die by this, and this, he writes, is called grasping virtue. And when we have grasped virtue, then we can achieve fixity. To be capable of both is called the perfected person. And so it is this striving to become a perfected person to which we are called. And in placing on our shoulders the burden, responsibility, or self-cultivation, it is also rooted in the belief that our human capacities allow this. And what more flattering and beautiful account of human nature is there than this? Thank you very much.
translate those data points, actually focus on that niche, go beyond the boundaries to do that. So if you like that, that new idea about the important issues. And then, oh, could we have a microphone here? Could you give it down? So, uh, not a question, maybe, just a comment. So, I heard some uh, speaker mention about the practical wisdom. Practical wisdom. So, it's true for me, both Chinese philosophy and Aristotle, they have a lot of attention to the uh, practical wisdom. But, uh, in my position, the speaker mentioned mainly the one side of the Basically, part of this section is maybe for some men need to be made away of maybe me and me and the daughter of me. But actually, besides this word, part of this is also the other important issue. That is, for part of this, always, both in the case of the Aristotle and Chinese philosophy, Exist. Uh, is uh, slightly linked close deep to the person, the human being. So, what characterism is not to be well, characterism is so contacted with general abuse, uh, principle, and particular practical situation. And this kind of just depend on, we rely on some kind of general abstract rule. But should be judged by a suitable person. So in this case, that would count the separate ways it could be the virtual analysis. Professor Liao, do you want to address that? The question, as I understood it, was about the role of practical wisdom and the way in which it requires the judgment of a wise person in a particular situation as opposed to a general rule. Okay, thanks for And the thanks for Professor Yang has expressed a bunch of comments. Actually, I use the practical risk term is I want to emphasize that it's related to the virtual, but it's also different to the virtual. So that's why I put this into two senses, but I have no I have mentioned that these two are related. So uh, according to your comment, I think I more And I think that we have time for one more question, and I saw uh, Cardinal Sorano's hands Thank you very much. That's fantastic lessons. And I want my last story. We know that for a song, the end of the ages is to have the eudaimonic virtues. The eudaimonic virtues is contemplation of the things that the same in the same way that God has the contemplation of itself. itself. So in, in, in relation with Confucian, what is it, the idea of the peace and the diamond or rest of Confucian? What is it? Is? Because one of the expositors say that minimum of supernatural <laughs> in this position. So uh, what this minimum, what is this minimum of supernatural in Confucian? <laughs> in Aristotle it's not minimum, it's fast. <laughs> but what is in Confucian? Thank you. Uh, if, if I may, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, I think there's an interesting similarity between Confucius and Aristotle in the respect that both deeply uh, theistic thinkers have admired them, but also very naturalistic thinkers have admired them. And those two groups argue about what the best way is to interpret them. So as you know, there's naturalistic people who give a naturalistic reading of Aristotle, but of course Aristotle was also central to the all the Abrahamic traditions and the thinkers who were deeply religious but thought that Aristotle would be great insights into it. And it's just a long-running argument. I have many uh, friends who consider themselves both Confucians and Christians. 
um, and so there was consistency between that. But on the other hand, I know naturalistic philosophers that say, aha, this is what's great about it. This is one of the reasons Confucius was kind of a patron saint of the Western Enlightenment, because uh, although the Jesuits admired Confucius, but also uh, naturalistic thinkers like Christian Wolf said, aha, this is why Confucius is so great. So, uh, I think it is true, in my opinion, that you see certainly in the Nicomachean ethics one conception of flourishing in which the best life is to be the most godlike and to contemplate being a great being. Uh, and you do not, in my opinion, find that view in Confucius. The view you find in Confucius is more like the view that you find earlier than the Nicomachean ethics. That the good life or the human life dedicated to the well being of the human community. And interestingly, as I recall, Aquinas in the Summa says that, well, if there were nothing higher than humans, then the best life for a human would be working for the good of the community. But Aquinas says, but of course, there is something higher than humans, which is God, which is why the greatest life for humans is the beatific vision of God after death. So I, I think it's a disputed issue what the relationship is between Confucianism and supernaturalism, but at least in my opinion, Confucius's conception of what it is to live well is different from the version of the good life of the Canonical Ten of the Nicomachean Ethics, where being the most godlike is the highest life for you. I think Jeff wants to talk about it. I didn't want to comment, but I wanted to ask a related question. We were in Cairo a couple of days ago and uh, at the Museum of the Egyptian Civilization. And one of the things that struck me there was the emphasis that the pharaohs placed on the Egyptian concept of Ma'at, uh, which is the concept of heavenly order. And Ma'at is actually the uh, daughter of the creator of God. She brings order to the universe, and the pharaohs, the rulers, were to uh, revere and pray to would be the intermediary with Ma. And the idea, as it was expressed, was that uh, the, the role of the ruler is to abide by the heavenly order. It reminded me, at least in the English translation, of the uh, having the mandate of heaven, uh, that uh, there was the natural order and the ruler either had the mandate of heaven or lost the mandate of heaven. But the idea was that, if I understand correctly, that the rule was uh, part of the, of, of the heavenly order or an ordered universe, and that when the dynasty fell, Christian world, we have similar concepts of uh, ruling in either as a part of the divine choice or as chosen of God and the, uh, being responsible for uh, the divine commandments. So my question is about the meaning of the, of the mandate of heaven, whether that was
but it's really contained within the possible certain kind of thing. So in that sense, you can find a different violation of the finger reason and the order of the, the whole possible. So I think that was, I think, the basic idea. The order idea, the order was, was really getting rid of the certain kind of order from the secret understanding from above, but something inside of the movements of the world. That, that, you know, that eloquent answer perhaps we should add in since we're a little over time, but thank you.
the polls then stand us to be naturally required in self-sufficiency to be individual. Now, cities and states around the world have recently faced major challenges from the COVID pandemic. Given Aristotle's views on the individual's relation to the polis, what principles should guide and inform public health policy for future pandemics of serious infectious diseases? On the one hand, I think, Aristotle principles oppose political inaction, or policies that seek to build rapid herd immunity by allowing dangerous diseases to spread rapidly. For Aristotle, as we've seen, human beings form the polis at least for the sake of securing rights. Thus, political institutions are bound to address infectious diseases that pose serious threats to the lives of their citizens. In this respect, uh, Aristotle who supports the World Health Organization's stated position on herd immunity approaches. Attempts to reach herd immunity through exposing people to a virus are scientifically problematic and unethical. Letting COVID-19 spread through populations of any age or health status will lead to unnecessary infections, suffering, and death. On the other hand, while large-scale lockdowns, shelter-in-place, and stay-at-home orders may prevent the spread of dangerous disease, Aristotelian principles imply at least a general presumption against such policies at least when other less restrictive, less coercive measures are available. From an Aristotelian perspective, after all, lockdowns come with significant costs with respect to securing living well, the policy's ultimate end. First, lockdowns, by their very nature, drastically interfere with social, civic, and political life. Instead, they isolate individuals and impede their exercising their essential capacities for conversing, socializing, and integrating together. Second, for Aristotle, human nature is not plastic. Uh, instead, it contains essential natural impulses for sociality. If so, lockdowns are contrary to human nature in a deep way and are apt to promote human language instead of human flesh. Aristotelians would expect increased rates of mental illness, social political disorder, and learning problems in locales that rely principally on lockdowns. In these respects, Aristotle's principles also support the WHO's stated position that while lockdowns can prevent uh, a spread of disease and by time, they nevertheless have a profound negative impact on individuals, communities, and societies by bringing social and economic life to their stock. How then should governments prepare for future pandemics? In response, the circumstances and particular capacities of existing countries and states vary widely. Yet the risk of insights, I think, would suggest certain initial policies as both feasible for a great many of the countries and as most compatible with our nature as political animals. These policies highlight some of the steps taken by Taiwan and South Korea, which mounted aggressive anti-COVID policies without the mind principally on lockdowns. These measures include proactive food monitoring of emerging disease threats, rapid r and measures that enable mass testing, efficient contact tracing uh, systems to track the spread of disease, and quarantining for those who become exposed and infected. Now, of course, the likes of Taiwan and South Korea face challenges later in the pandemic as the pandemic spread around the world and became harder to control. But had the world's governments consistently pursued these basic measures early and vigorously, the need for more restrictive measures from across the globe may well have been minimized. So, in short, by adopting such measures, governments, from a resilient perspective, would have met their responsibilities to protect the lives of their citizens. At the same time, they would have done a better job of maintaining the conditions required for citizens to lead a good life. And for the Aristotelian, this is the key end of the sake of which the policy exists, and then for which individuals are not self sufficient. Thanks. Thank you all. Our next speaker will be Tao Zhang, Professor of Religion and Philosophy at Rutgers University and Director of the Rutgers Center.
very much. So um, for today's talk, I want to deal with the concept of personal freedom, especially the kind of challenges it has uh, within the more indigenous Chinese context. Uh, because the Chinese uh, culture is not exactly known for, for its uh, you know, sort of advocacy for, uh, for personal freedom, at least that's the sort of common understanding. I want to sort of go into the idea that there is actually a tradition of personal freedom, but then there is, you know, there, there, is, a, there is a certain challenge because of its rather sort of kind of value. Um, I want to start with um, this very uh, famous story in Johnson Park. All of us, um, it's the favorite text for most of us, or maybe all of us. Um, it's about a carpenter and his, you know, his, um, his disciples who were walking around, uh, the, you know, who were walking by a huge tree. And the carpenter just didn't even take a look at the tree, and uh, you know, the puzzle of his disciple is like, you know, what's up with that? Why did you, you know, you would, do, as a carpenter, you would just be grabbing to the you know, Tree and see how wonderful and beautiful it is. Uh, and, uh, and you know, the, the carpenter was like, eh, it's a useless tree, don't waste your time on it. It doesn't measure up to anything. It gnarled, it, you know, it's cramped, it's not, you can't use it for me to really make anything, either for furniture, for gold, for anything, just to really use it. And then, you know, after he got home, he, uh, he, uh, he, he had a dream from the tree. This is the kind of text that John says. Um, he was saying, who are you to say that I'm useless? Um, you know, look at all the useful trees. How long did they live? They were all torn apart as soon as they were some fruits and they measured up. You, 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 you guys cut a gun to make this and that. And, uh, and then look at me. Um, and so, and then the, you know, the, you know, the carpenter was, uh, you know, woke up and, uh, and then shared a story with his disciple. And, and Learn the lesson of the, of the usefulness of the uselessness. And that's the sort of idea. And this is one version of the story. Okay. So, this, the, the, the usefulness, or uh, well, the uselessness in some ways, it's, it's, a, it's a way of understanding that the Johnson does not exactly identify with the so called mainstream value. So, just from the so called mainstream value, so that Johnson and Thomas were pretty useless. So one of these sort of mainstream uh, values within the Chinese tradition is usually understood to be uh, to be uh, sort of a community character, right? They're represented by the Confucians. That's the uh, an indisputable uh, mainstream uh, Chinese formative values. And you know, and, and you can, there, there are lots of ways to talk about it. One way to talk about it is that it emphasizes the human directionality, not our individuality. But of course, in, you know, in relationality has a certain structure to it. It's not just the fact that I'm relational and relational is a hierarchy to it and that can lead to all kinds of problems, as we know. The other is this long standing discussion about the, 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 the discourse about the public and the private and the early on, the, you know, the, these two domains are more neutral to me in describing what belongs to the public and what belongs to the private. But gradually, uh, this move to have to, to take on certain sort of a limited value, sort of public, becomes overwhelmingly positive. That's associated with universality, wholesomeness, impartiality, whereas you know the private is associated with selfishness, with fragmentation, and the personal desire and so on and so forth. So you can see where uh, this might uh, lead to. But then Thomas, in this case, was a sort of a, um, a, um, a, a, a an outsider, right? Uh, in an outlier to this um, mainstream um, Chinese view, represented towards the state of state by Confucian. So for Thomas, he is known for advocating um, personal freedom, meaning that is, you know, he advocated for a kind of personal state that's usually cultivated space within which we can explore. Uh, we can be ourselves and also be associated with the people that we choose to be associated with, like our friends. Um, and then and another thing is that he also advocates preserving a kind of a part of the sensation machine um, that does not identify with the dominant social political values. And that stuff also you know, very much reflected in this useless tree example. And this is how Jones will really maintain. Uh, is a personal space within which the personal freedom can be inserted. Um, I think the 
And there I can create a motion and certainly do the process and certainly do different processes that will bring that enforcement. That's what's controversial. So how am I going to explain what's controversial? I think I'm just going to do it essentially by giving you an extended metaphor of what I'm calling the dysfunctional family, right? The family that claims rights against one another in order to resolve social coordination problems within the family context. And then um, uh, uh, after that, I'm going to sort of highlight two or three things that seem to be particularly problematic about uh, the family that faces this social coordination of rights and rights claiming. And then if there's time, I wouldn't bet on it, uh, I'll sort of draw out some conclusions and implications. All right, so the dysfunctional rights claiming family. Imagine, if you will, that you're in a family where there are certain sort of core, well-established entitlements that everyone shares, all right? So maybe uh, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, a kind of human violence, or a kind of human that everyone's entitled to. And for any other interests you may have beyond that, you just have to negotiate, right? You have to sort of bargain and really deal with people. And moreover, we have in this family the right consciousness Sometimes called right consciousness, awareness of their rights, that people are um, alert to them, they're sensitive to people's rights, they're aware of their ability to claim them, and so on. And of course, they have processes that are being enforced. So, in this family, we have people who are, you know, uh, they're entitled to their allowance, they move about. Um, sometimes there are borderline cases where they, you know, they might want to make a claim to some good that they think is a right, but it's not entirely clear. So imagine that the youngest son in the family is, uh, has some kind of chronic illness or develops a chronic illness. And the family doesn't have a lot of resources, but one of the older sisters just so happens to have a well-paying job. Um, and so she's the sort of person who's in the right position to provide medicine and health care to the youngest brother. But in order to do so, he has to make a claim, and she has to you know, have to litigate it. We have other sorts of problems. I mean, maybe uh, uh, one of the siblings is not particularly good at mathematics, and then the other older sister is good at mathematics. So, in a normal, well functioning family, she would step up and do some tutoring. But uh, in this family, it's uh, not clear. There's it's no clear, well established, well established, or well defined right. And so, the poor uh, boy has to kind of negotiate in order to get his tutoring. So that it is what I consider to be, at minimum, a dysfunctional family, or perhaps we can even simply say not a family at all. So, um, uh, and if you're bothered by that picture, then I think you'll have some intuitive grasp of what it is that's controversial about rights and rights in the confusion context. All right. So that's point one. Is that the point two is going to be sort of distill those that illustration and talk about what it is that makes rights and rights kind of controversial. Context. So let me offer three tentative suggestions. One word that sometimes comes up in these debates about issues of individual rights is that in this particular context, we see uh, people's moral intelligence and moral claims sort of uh, preserved, promoted, and protected in a conflictual way through conflict rather than harmony. You can imagine much more harmonious ways to think that you can do that uh, they can imagine the older sister of the young doctor just steps up and pays for the medicine without even asking. Good, thanks. Uh, so, um, uh, so that's one, one concern. Another concern is that the entitlements that are sort of legally guaranteed you know, uh, are not, more or less non negotiable. That's how we understand uh, rights in, in sort of uh, right to protecting rights on the society. Um, and for some people, that, uh, some confusion is that particularly bothers them. It means that the family can't sort of be dynamic enough to, uh, to lay claim to certain group uh, uh, interests and goods that require a great deal more guidance and context sensitivity. But the third issue, and this is the one that I think the Aristotelians in this room are really big behind, is just that in very subtle ways, and the last, I don't have time to sort of spell out here, Rights and rights claiming undermines virtuous other directed modes to take care of others, right? So why should uh, siblings be stepping up for their siblings when, uh, uh, when they have chronic illness and need health care or medicine? Why should 
be stepping up and offering tutoring and looking help. Well, we say affection, loyalty, devotion, right? Those are the virtuous motives. Whereas in this life death in society, it seems like the third punishment can't help but sort of take uh, a place of prominence in people's psychology. So that's my attempt in the short time in lives to uh, sort of describe why it is that uh, individual rights have become a point of contention in Confucianism, as I understand. So with what time we have left, I'll just simply say that there are sort of more steps we can take in a more conceptual move, but I think are really helpful here to understand the debate. Um, and this has to do with the degree to which in Confucian societies we would foreground or background rights and rights consciousness. All right? That is, foregrounding them makes us, it sort of presupposes that in some sense we have uh, mechanisms of rights claiming and rights enforcement that are relatively available, ready at hand, that we're aware of. And backgrounding implies that instead there are all these mediating institutions that are meant to provide other ways to address the people's basic needs and interests before we resort to claiming rights. And I think one thing that many of us who participate in this debate on individual rights, which this is going agree on, is that in the Confucian society, if there is a place for rights, I think um, in, the, in the different contexts of adopted, they should sink well into the background so that we have a number of mediating practices and institutions that, uh, that prevent us from sort of moving too quickly to the point where we're threatening our own rights. So I hope I've given you a something like an interview picture of how this debate can go. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker today will be Chen Sao, a doctoral student in philosophy at Columbia University. Unlike questions of sense 
say they are collective in nature, and I will call them collective appearances. Disagreements about these appearances are notoriously difficult, if not impossible, to resolve. So if you disagree about how many people are in this room, the disagreement could be resolved by us going around and counting how many people are here. However, if we disagree about the nature of justice, it's not so clear how we would even go about to address this disagreement. And another important insight of ancient Greek ethics is that the human psyche doesn't develop in the vacuum. We enter the world, even as babies, ready to absorb those collective appearances. Moreover, collective appearances exert a very strong psychological pull on us. The world strikes us in a certain way, and we cannot simply will ourselves out of it. And this point, I think, is exemplified by the cave allegory. The prisoners who were told are like us have been there since childhood, fixed in the same place, with their necks and legs bent able to see only what's in front of them because of their bands prevent them from turning their heads around. So, so Plato, pathology on a level of society leads to the corruption of individual psychology. I would like to raise the question of what that means for collective responsibility, the topic of our session. And I'd like to make three preliminary suggestions. First, as a society, we need to acknowledge the psychological pull of collective appearances. And second, we need to ask questions about their harms and benefits. For example, does conflicting appearances lead to conflicted psyche, as Plato suggests? And last but not least, we need to realize that individuals' psychological well-being is not merely a matter of individual responsibility. This, matter, this point might be a little counterintuitive, but I think if we take those collective appearances seriously, that's what we have to think about. Um, what is the collective responsibility in terms of individual psychological Thank you. That's my conclusion. Thank you. Our next speaker is Wood Sung, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Nanyang Technological University. So 
So I think it, it won't take me a lot to explain the importance of trustworthiness in the society. So I think so long as we are socially situated, we cannot avoid interacting with other people in some ways, even if these interactions are not deep and meaningful kind. So suppose we go to a cafe and we uh, order coffee, we trust that the barista will not poison us. And it will cause a lot of social disruptions if we constantly ask you to prove to check uh, you haven't poisoned us. Um, so a breakdown of trust in these small scale scenarios will cause disruptions and inconvenience to many people. So here uh, I will talk about three concepts in conclusion four. Um, they are not exhausted exhausted of conclusion of how trustworthiness, but I believe that these concepts sit at the center of conclusion thought and we have to deal with them in some way when we consider the conclusion of how trustworthiness. Uh, one concept is shame, uh, which is quite crucial and that word itself is often translated as trustworthiness. Uh, the second one is joy, uh, which sometimes translated as loyalty, sometimes it means a wholehearted devotion. And the third one is chong, which means sincerity and wholeness. So xin, uh, there are many aspects important to xin. So here I will only highlight one aspect that I think is important. And that is the aspect of xin that requires some presentation to match the way one in fact is. So um, one who is xin has to be aware of her audience uptake and endeavor to ensure that the audience uptake of what she is like is maximally in line with the way she is. For example, suppose I'm a vegetarian and I find myself at a dinner table with my colleagues uh, who I'm getting to know and then the topic of animal ethics, um, animal rights come up and we're talking about and then I say, oh, I'm a vegetarian. Um, so in that context, it heavily implies that I care about animal rights and but suppose I'm a vegetarian for religious reasons, so here I should be sensitive enough to the context and the audience uptake and quickly ask something like, but I'm a vegetarian for religious reasons. Um, so uh, if I don't add that I, I didn't lie to anyone, I didn't deceive, but suppose later if you are my colleagues and you find out that I'm, I'm a vegetarian for religious reasons, you might think yeah. something is off, although you can't It doesn't take a lot of self-consciousness. So it's not like you have to be extra self-conscious and always monitoring uh, your audience uptake. It just requires some basic communication skills. As long as one is a calm, competent communicator, for example, the language I'm using now, the words I'm using, I'm using, I expect that you have a certain uptake. And I'm not trying to manipulate you, I'm not trying to be extra self-conscious about it, but I can gauge my audience uptake of what I'm saying, what I'm communicating. Now for John, uh, again, I just highlight the aspect of John that is about wholehearted devotion, and in the uh, early text, John is often discussed in the context of giving advice of speech act. So I will focus on the aspect that John requires one to give your honest advice that is looking out for the audience's best interest. So that means uh, something that you honestly believe that is the best for the audience, but you have done the work, um, you have done the research for that person. So suppose your friend comes up to you and asks, like, should I pick up this job offer? If you're a joint friend, you should try to understand the job, understand what your friends is like, what they want, and try to offer the best advice that's looking after the interests of the audience. So in that case, you can't just say, follow your heart, do whatever you want. But yes, maybe in that way you'll be supportive, but you're not jump in a confusion sense. And then Chong uh, requires uh, a, um, an aspect that I focus on is devoid of conflicts. So one important aspect of Chong is that devoid of inner and um, outer conflicts. So one doesn't present herself a certain way, and when in fact 
one is not that way. So this is a bit different. So the focus is different in the sense that it, it, it related to the second part about the world in the conflict. So it's not like uh, I, I desire something and I'm also not desiring that thing. And according to the early conclusion, this inner conflict will inevitably manifest outside um, a certain kind of outer manifestation. Maybe it's in a micro expression that you show some reluctance. Um, your audience can detect uh, or pick up, but it's hard, a little hard to track. So, um, for example, if my friend is in town, I want to go out, but somehow I'm also wanting to stay at home and finish up a project. And I have an inner conflict here. So if I go out, in a way I'm not being not trustworthy, I really want to go out. Oh, part of me really want to stay home and finish the project. So there is an inner conflict that might generate some inner outer conflict as well. And that, in that sense, is people not being trouble. So once we consider these aspects of the confusion conception of trustworthiness, then I want to talk about what that means for the part of the individual and what it means for the society. So for the individual, I think one interesting thing is about the social stance that the individual is taking. So in the Western like contemporary literature of trust, you can look at a lot of the discussion is about the relationship between a trustor and a trustee. So they imply that there's already some kind of relationship between the trustor and trustee in place. And the question is how, how that conveyed to the person who's trusting you. Here in the Confucian account, that's not even a trustor in place yet. But still, you have to be trustworthy. Not because these people are your trustor, but simply because they're social members of a society that worth your respect. And, um, and then in this way you're doing epistemic loan sharing for them. So like just by putting accurate information on the CV, you are doing some epistemic work for them. So they don't have to go out there and check the background. So that is uh, reducing their load and also empowering them epistemically. So you put them into a good epistemic position as much as possible to help them know. And on the part of society, all of the kind of enabling conditions that society can offer. For example, by setting up rituals so that it's easier for the communicator to communicate. For example, if I wear a ring on my ring finger, I'm conveying a certain message. But in a not so ritualistic society, it might not convey anything. But in a modern society, we have to track the bottom line. So how much ritual is stifling? How much ritual is enabling? And also, last, last one. So, um, for example, we can also to think about, um, for example, disadvantage that minority groups in a society, for example, um, they might feel inferior, they might feel scared to express themselves, they may need to hide that accent, they might need to not express that, what they actually do on their birthday, and everybody say they eat cake and blow candles. So, how do we create a society that actually creates good conditions for them to be trustworthy? Thank you again. Thank you. And our final speaker today will be Yan Hao Wei uh, from the Confucius Research Institute in the Confucius Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad uh, 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 to visit this Confucius uh, Confucius class. Uh, public related uh, 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 registration and officials. Uh, my the title of my uh, speech is the wisdom of corruption uh, and the and the diversity of human civilization. Uh, first of all, the meaning is uh, how many uh, gives birth to the uh, mirror things. Uh, when it comes to him, we each can first can function translation as family. People familiar with the Chinese culture may think of the Confucius approach uh, towards that example process harmony, not community. That achieving harmony is the most valuable 
affection as all sitting property. In fact, more than two hundred years before the birth of Confucius, idea of the, the idea of rule was already premature. Going a class of preaching a Chinese classic record to the court of the school and the one of Jane discussed the political protest of the Western Jew dynasty and forwards the idea of creation with me in lending the words and standing of the uh, coexistence and the prosperity of a diverse human civilization. First, I want to talk about its implications for the in interdependence of human civilization. Creation is the profound connotation. Creation is the child's wisdom of a company and the symbiosis of all things in the world and the perception of, of a living civilization. The ancient Chinese look at also being the all vision of nature. It is said the things in the world, rather being separation, separate, war and ultimately in the public community with a shared future. Sorry. Uh, the ancient the times look at all the things of the nature it is that the things in the world. Thus, we separate all and all community in an in independent community with a shared future. This is an uh, art of nature source of the earlier con confirmation traditions that when incredibly and the focus on success and the harmony is, is fully realized the heaven and the and earth, making them proper place and all things growing in the world. Secondly, the equality and the balance, equality and the balance of famous civilizations, uh, uh, it is all about simple truth. Uh, simple truth if human belief was to achieve the desired reason in Xi Jinping and then uh, and the need is to maintain the necessary balance between all things. A short it is the former king makes her to with Jin Mu Sui and Tui and who to greet the near things. The ancient times believe that everything in the world is composed of an element like Jin Mu Sui or Tui which achieved a temporary and balance of the mutual generation. And uh, okay. This is perfect really the risk for the price of diver uh, dash human civilizations is the modern world. Finally, the interpretation of human civilizations probably has two distinct which draw confidence as the whole is identified. While the nature is the least of speaking to encounter people following the principle, the principle of, the, of harmony, she proposed that harmony could be achieved by the integration of different things, and this is important in quality of the uh, 
transformational issue for society. Aristotle starts with the idea, well, we can't do anything without community, learn to live properly in the community. And the Anglo-Saxon view is the meaning of our life is as individuals. And of course, we want to contract with others or not have others kill us. So we need to find some way that we're going to deal with others. Very different idea. And the solution in the Anglo-Saxon vision starts with Hobbes, goes to Locke, and goes to Smith, Adam Smith. Uh, actually, I put four in my own view about this. Hobbes, Locke, Mandeville, and Smith. Hobbes said, we're individuals. If you leave us alone, we'll kill each other. So we better have an all-powerful state, the main purpose of which is to stop us from killing each other. It's a lovely view. Uh, he does not have any human uh, sympathy in there. Uh, he said, man's ambitions, tastes are insatiable, whether it's for fame, glory, power, wealth, and therefore the collision is the number one factor. Stop the collision is having one enforceable place, uh, and that is the Leviathan. Locke is a little bit uh, more uh, calm about this, but he says we're on our own. We own our own body and our own labor. That's where we get our property from. And since we own our own selves, we own our own property. And the role of the state is to protect that property, not more. The state should not meddle in the property. That's ours. The state should protect the property. So Locke not only wanted consent of the government, which we take to be a high ideal that people consent to their government, but he didn't want the government doing much of anything other than protecting property because that would violate the personal liberty. In the 18th century, things got even stranger in my view. And probably the best expression of Anglo-Saxon philosophy that I know is the fable of the bees of Mandeville. Because it says, like Hobbes, people are rapacious. But if you let them be rapacious, what a wonderful beehive you end up with. It's powerful, it's rich, everybody likes it. He was reflecting the ethos of the early British Empire. It's powerful, it's conquering, it's admired, it's feared, and vice has done all of that. So he even champions the vice that, uh, that uh, Hobbes talked about because it's going to produce great wealth, power, and glory for the whole beehive, for the whole community. Then Smith comes along following uh, Mandeville by about uh, 70, uh, by about uh, yeah, 70 years actually from the first edition of the Table of Peace, and says markets are the best way to resolve all these differences among individuals because markets uh, allow everybody to have their tastes to pursue their wealth. But it all comes out of the day again by an invisible hand, which was a phrase in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Protestant England to be providential, that the world is designed in an orderly way, in this case through the markets. And so you can be selfish, self-interested, pursuing your own wealth, but in the end, things will come out okay and uh, by an invisible hand. And Smith doesn't mention anything about honor, which is quite strange. 
It's all about wealth. But he says that the workmen, by the, in the end, will be okay because rich people have to spend money and that's where the poor will earn their livelihoods. It's very brilliant and very complacent at the same time. Just to add on uh, this community issue, the next phase got really nasty because uh, 20 years after Smith wrote, Thomas Malthus wrote, it's worse than we thought. It's not really wealth. We're all struggling above poverty because of population dynamics. And so it's really a struggle for survival. And by the middle of the 19th century, when Darwin gave a, uh, Darwin adopted Malthus and gave a brilliant explanation of the natural world, it was taken by the social philosophers as a justification for societies to fight against other societies at the societal level because now we're struggling for survival and don't care for the poor because they're a drain on our survival. We are in a struggle toward the end for survival and the Nazis took this to the racial struggle for survival. Uh, and the worst crimes in history. But the main point I want to make is that in the Western history, the individual and society had a many transformations. What we live with today in our philosophy, in my opinion, is the British made world. Because Britain became so powerful, we are living in a world of seven. 18th, 17th and 18th century British philosophy, which is quite different from most of Western philosophy. My interpretation is that it was a philosophy that came to justify empire, so I'm not too keen about it. It's got its merits, but it's a very peculiar philosophy uh, in a lot of ways because it ended up uh, denying anything about not even that it exists. Margaret Thatcher said there is no such thing as society, just individuals. Uh, and that is what it's taken to its full conclusion. I think for China, this is also an extraordinarily important issue, uh, the question of the individual and society. My own very simplistic understanding is that uh, Confucianism, because of its emphasis on order and Chinese history and statecraft, uh, really is the more aristocratic and put the community ahead of the individual to a large extent. And I think it's absolutely a fascinating question. I also wonder uh, if I could say in a crude sociological way, whether there is some explanation of this in the history of the different societies. If you are an American and you go into a dining hall, you expect, I, I want this, I don't want this, I like this on this, and could you leave this off this plate and this? So everything is your individual desire. If you go into a Chinese dining hall, the unbelievable throughput of good food and serving 5,000 people in an hour is astounding. Uh, and we have choice because uh, the food comes around, but uh, without being facetious, the need to regulate a society with millions already 2,000 years ago is a different phenomenon, I think. So the density,
except this is the few things that they read. But it's coming from the most extreme philosophical viewpoint in the U.S., which is this British libertarian viewpoint, which is by itself a bizarre philosophy. So it's not only the geopolitics, it's also one very bizarre philosophy trying to interpret a place that people know nothing about. And this is part of what we need to help to overcome these misunderstandings, both across societies and even within our own histories. So that was the point I wanted to make. Just what all wonderful observations were. Wonderful observations. Thank you very much. We have a question in the back of the room.
the scope is bigger. Yes. Um, because um, I think unlike the more liberal conception where there is a really strong contrast between the individual and the goal of the private and the public, there isn't so much of explicit contrast, I think, in uh, Aristotle and Plato. Um, and the individual, they are very much part of the world. It's not a subject uh, standing in contrast to the rest of the world. They are part of the world. And so I think for them, it makes sense to think about how to think about collective responsibility, so to speak, in a much more broader conception. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we had a question from the director. So there's a question for uh, a number of panelists, and I'll let you uh, sort out who should answer it. But it seems like one of the big differences between the Aristotelian conception of politics and some of the alternatives, maybe so for the Confucian tradition as well, is just what the scope of, the, not the topics that politics should be concerned with, but the level of political life. And the Greek politics is small, it's about the scale of maybe what I've been. City. And it seems like on that scale you can have the kinds of relationships that are needed to sustain the high ideals and the high aims of politics. Uh, that becomes impossible even on the scope of a whole modern dense city, let alone vast continents and nations. Um, so this is a practical question, which is how can we avoid, for instance, lowering the bar of politics so far that we're just left with claiming basic rights or trying to use human rights discourse to settle moral and political matters that we just can't get to because it's not substantive enough, it sets a floor on behavior and it is directed towards what national governments should be doing, not what individuals should be doing with respect to each other, presumably. Um, what can we do about this problem, this kind of mismatch between, let's say, what maybe a lot of people in this room think is human nature, that we flourish in thick relation to others at small scales, and the fact that our political lives are so odds with it. Do we need those speakers Processes that kick into gear 
uh, before you ever get to the point where you're filing a legal claim. So, um, uh, for example, sometimes, you know, a work supervisor gets involved and they see a relationship falling apart, there's uh, official arbitration processes, and so on. So, uh, those are two examples of the sorts of ways in which we can um, avoid the rush to the sort of worst case scenario uh, uh, political institution mechanism enforcement that we see in the mind. But there's much more here. Thank you. Again, uh, we've been very crushed for time, and so I would like to end our session here so that we can uh, continue the conversation over a communal meal, a uh, way of building a community from the ground up. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you after the lunch break.